This is Commodity Wrap. Well, welcome to uh, Wednesday as markets settled in mixed territory. A little pressure in the equities. Dow NASDAQ moving lower, S&P a little higher. And at the end of the session, uh, we saw corn moving higher, soybeans lower, though mill moving higher, higher at the wheat exchange, and all three, and cotton higher. To help us break it down, we go to the president of Midwest Market Solutions. It's Brian Hoops. Brian, welcome back to the show. Hey, Tony. It's a double header day where we get to talk twice in one day, morning and then afternoon. So I guess we'll talk about how dumb or smart we were early this morning. In our yeah, no, no kidding. And sometimes I wonder, uh, I, you may talk to me more than uh, you talk to family members, but I'm <laughs> glad. Let's... Uh, let's in on kind of one of the first things we talked about this morning was a flash sale. Uh, over 200,000 metric tons of beans to China. And then there's this other one that we keep seeing about received and delivered. What is that and, and what can we pull from it? Yeah, you know, I think there's a lot of debate about what, what is that, what does it exactly entail, and what does it mean. And, you know, the best explanation that we've heard or have been given is that when it says it's received, that means it's imported into the country and then it's sold. So it's uh, most likely um, corn and, and soybean meal. Soybeans are sometimes brought into the country in, in places like North Carolina where they don't grow a lot of product there and they have to uh, import it either from central parts of the region of the U.S. or from South America. But it looks like it was imported into the country and then turned around and sold. So it it equates to about 7.4 million bushels and how it affects our balance sheets is if you look at the USDA balance sheets on a monthly supply and demand report, they always talk about, you know, 10 million, 12 million, 15 million bushels of imports. Um, so they'll count towards that import but then it will also count as uh, an export because it was eventually sold out of the country. So the net effect is zero. It doesn't really change our balance sheets, but the sale that we did have to China this morning, if they in fact do take it and, and accept delivery of it, that's, an, that's about seven and a half million bushels. That will change our balance sheets slightly. Um, and that's what the trade, I think, found a little bit of support on. But again, we're focused on a higher dollar and weather and those two things are bearish today, so we really didn't get a lot of footing off of this uh, export news. And again, these exports can be canceled at some point down the road. Mainly, when, when China buys these products during uh, our harvest time frame, they're stocking up on all their needs that they, that they have from when Brazil runs out of soybeans in the summer until they have their fresh crop harvested starting in late January. So they stock up on U.S. products, so they accept some deliveries, and then they also buy some that's a hedge that if South American supplies are not as big as what they expect, that they have U.S. to fall back on in February, March, when Argentina and Brazil would normally be harvesting and exporting product. You know, uh, since we're talking about, you know, exports, I found this really interesting today. It was, uh, it just made the news, Colombia Imports are up 4.4% year over year. It's the fifth increase in two years, and it's led by ag imports, which are up nearly 18%. China is uh, credited with about 26.7%, the U.S. 237 Colombia has been a big buyer of U.S. corn, i.e., fourth largest export customer for U.S. corn. Is this, uh, is this something we, we need to keep an eye on? I mean, it seems like we, we always talk China in our conversations, but what about some of the smaller countries that are potential big buyers? Well, yeah, that's you know really who's been buying a lot of our products is some of these smaller countries. As you mentioned, Colombia, uh, it's not been the major buyer of, of China, of course, Mexico is the biggest buyer of U.S. corn for two years now by far and away. Um, but, yeah, it, it's some of these countries, as you mentioned, like Colombia, uh, Canada, Mexico, that don't have the high freight costs that will buy from the U.S. And 
I also saw an interesting stat uh, since we talked this morning that um, the largest portion of U.S. corn oil sorghum sales are to China. About 95% uh, of what we grow here in the U.S. is sold to China in the form of grain sorghum. So China is buying a, a few of our products. They just uh, are not buying U.S. corn as they can buy it uh, cheaper from the Ukraine. They can buy it cheaper from Argentina. And they are looking at price as uh, one of their main factors when make these purchases. Of course, they're also going to be looking at possible tariffs uh, in 2025 on any purchases that they would make. All right. Brian, hang on. I want to take a break, and when we come back, we'll dig into the livestock futures and some of the outside markets as well. Brian Hoops is president, Midwest Market Solutions. Commodity Wrap continues in a moment. This is Commodity Wrap. In our first segment, we talked with Brian Hoops, President, Midwest Market Solutions. And surprise, Brian's back for segment two. Hey, Brian, <laughs> thanks for hanging around here. And uh, before you go in a little bit, we'll get some contact information and how we can talk one-on-one -on -one with you. Let's look at livestock futures on Wednesday. Live cattle settled mostly higher, feeders higher, and hogs higher. Seems like last last week about this time, I think we were talking about uh, some pressure uh, that was kind of working into the markets. Well, we're moving higher. What's what's the catalyst here? Yeah, I think if we look at the cattle market, you, you know, we came into the week, and I think everyone was fully expecting steady at best to probably lower prices. Um, but the Packers did expand their kills for the beginning of the week. We're about 13,000 head uh, more killed this week than last week. And uh, we saw that as, as a positive. The Packers may need some cattle, and thus they were expanding kills. Uh, we'd see at least steady to higher cash trades. So markets, or futures market, I should say, rallied uh, for two days anyway, anticipating that we would see that stronger cash trade. Plus, feeder cattle were really the catalyst for the upside. That's where we've seen a lot of strength in the cash markets. Big rallies in the feeder cattle contracts, and uh, we're still discount to that feeder cattle index. January, well, November goes off the board tomorrow. January uh, will be the lead month and, and is the lead month, but it's still over $2 discount to where the index is. And that index is a direct reflection of the cash markets. And it does appear that um, producers in the plains where they've had a lot of rain are, are increasing their demand for calves and stocker cattle. They're wanting to put uh, some calves out on, on grass pastures this uh, fall, this winter, and they are paying uh, for the cash markets to do that. That's reflected in the feeder cattle index and really a driving force in the entire cattle complex as uh, feeder cattle have rallied sharply and pulled, to a extent, pulled the live cattle along with it, although we expect to see cash trade probably uh, steady to a dollar higher uh, when it commences later this week. All right, I'm going to throw out some numbers here. 99.9%. 103.3%, 105.1%. Talking about cattle on feed, placements, and markets. We get a cattle on feed report after the close on Friday. Is this one that could throw a surprise at us? Um, yeah, to an extent, I think. Well, um, if, I think if there is a surprise, I'm looking at a little bit more bearish numbers on the on feed and placement category. I think you could see placements 5% larger than a year ago, which, as you alluded to, could be a little bit of a bearish surprise for the market. And if that is the case, um, we'd probably take these live cattle back down a few dollars uh, in the February, April, June time frame. Um, I don't know that you're going to see a lot of change in the on-feed. I think we're going to come in pretty close to where we were a year ago. And then numbers should tighten up as we go into January, February time frame. So it's, it's probably a matter of time to work through some of these supplies and then we get into those tighter numbers, um, but we'll see. We'll see what it has to say uh, on Friday if that report comes out. But usually, there's a surprise or two from the government. All right. Speaking of reports, we get uh, a stocks report. Energy Information Administration, or EIA, for crude. They say we expanded our uh, stocks of crude up 545,000 barrels. Gasoline up 2 million barrels, 
and really the largest since early September. West Texas Intermediate moving lower on Wednesday. Our Bob or gasoline lower and Nat gas higher. What do you pull from the energies? Uh, yeah, not a surprise that uh, crude oil stocks coming in larger than expected. I don't think, uh, and the market did weaken after that report came out. But uh, we've seen several weeks here in a row now where stocks are starting to build rather than decline. Uh, we are just, I think, producing too much oil right now in the U.S. without a strong trading partner. And we, you know, we talked about soybeans in, in China in our last segment. Well, China's a big buyer of energy products as well, um, and with their softer demand, the uh, softer economy, they may not have as much interest in buying uh, crude oil from the United States. So a lot of what we what we produce is exported, and um, so we're we're reliant upon that as we continue to drill and and produce a lot of product. Prices are probably a little bit overvalued here, given how much supply we're putting on the market. Yeah, you mentioned that because we really import the the crude that we refine here. It's it's not what we're drilling, and our imports, according to EIA, up to 137,000 barrels, and that was the largest since June, so maybe a little pressure there in the gasoline market. Okay. We mentioned this early on. We're talking with Brian Hoops, President of Midwest Market Solutions. But, Brian, if we want to talk with you one-on-one, -on -one, can we find you on the World Wide Web? Yeah, we have a website that uh, you can sign up to receive text messages, our Twitter feed, or sign up for our YouTube series there at MidwestMarketSolutions.com. It has a list of our offices around the Midwest and their phone numbers so you can reach out to any of our brokers, and they can help you out. But uh, my direct number it's 417-501-5132. Brian Hoops, Midwest Market Solutions, and this is Commodity Wrap.